To my right, you have the. To my right, you have the distinguished. To my right. To my right, you have the distinguished. To my right, you got the beater of dead. To my right, you got the beater of drums and dead horses, Mr. John Alfredson. To my left, singer Johannes Eckerström from Avatar. Yes, and you're watching. And listening to. Linear Rock. Brilliant, okay, ah. so we got it, good, good, good. <laughs> welcome, Avatar, to Milan, and welcome to Linea Rock. Grazie mille, it's Grazie. good to be here. An honor for us to have you here, you're a great band, you have a long career already, but in Italy not everybody knows about the band, even if the show that you're playing tonight in Milano at the Legend Club is sold out, I heard. So... Uh, I, I, I believe you! <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Well, the thing is, we have been here for a whole bunch of times through the years, especially as, you know, we've been opening for that feels like billions of bands, but it took so many years before we could, you know, follow it up with a show of our own. Yeah. That was the first time, I guess, two years ago. Have we have Yes. Because yes, we did Padova never, and Romagnano. Yeah, 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 that was never in Milan, though. No, this exactly. It's the first time in Milano. Okay. Yeah. So since 2001, this is just the second time you are headlining in Italy? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, wow. And Feathers and Flesh. Uh, is the seventh, the sixth album actually, it's the sixth album. Yeah, depending how you count. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so the, what do you mean? There are no, it can be six, it can be seven. Oh, seven okay. seven. <laughs> so when it came out last May, uh, you stated that nothing will be the same ever again. Is it a promise or a menace? <laughs> well, it's a promise. I, I think it's, um, it's a very bold statement that we make, uh, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> But because that is how we feel every time we put something out there, we torture ourselves and each other to when we make our albums. We, you know, we never want to work after a strict formula mm -hmm. and all that. So that leads that leads to uh, great results through lots and lots of suffering. And every time Avatar puts something new out, it's always different. Yes, uh, from the beginning, it's actually yeah. almost a different man now. So it's uh, yeah, uh, but it's also natural when you think yeah. that we start to play together when me and John we were 16 years old, but and and John was 14, 15. Like we were really, really teenagers and learned how to play. So it would be even stranger if we would have I don't know sounded the same as we did <laughs> in 2001 because we started so young and it would have sounded awful. <laughs> Okay, we'll talk about your story, but let's stick to the last album first. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the concept behind it about? And I read it's like a circus of fairy tales and talking animals. Can yeah. you can you actually explain that better? Well, what we did is we wrote a fable. We did a. It's a. The album even comes with a storybook for those interested. So, it is a fable about an owl who goes to war. I. Uh, to stop the sun from rising. Okay. And uh, he, uh, her uh, antagonist, her enemy in this, is the mighty eagle. And so it's their battle, and they meet lots of other animals along the way. And, you know, it's that, just like in a classic fable, they all play the role of portraying different um, human characteristics. Mm -hmm. And the whole story around the songs, like the lyrics are basically the thoughts and words spoken by all these animals. But in between, in the storybook, you have it in form of this kind of epic poem. Uh, I wanted to be Dante Alighieri a bit. <laughs> and <laughs> okay. just through poetry, tell, tell right. a coherent story. So yeah, that's, that's the thing. And it became quite a beast of an album because of this. What did it come first, actually? The music uh, or the melodies or the story? Well, the music. The um, music first. Oh, because we are always writing something, you know. Um, but I think the story, the story was, you know, a tool that we used while writing the songs as well. Mm. But there's always a bit of music first. Like it, it was not so much like, okay, now comes the song about the fish. So let's write a fish song. It was more like. Okay, here are a bunch of ideas. Mm -hmm. Ah, that one sounds like a fish song, you know, Black Waters. Okay. So there's always the music, you know, the music leads the way also when you do it like this. 
And the producer of Feathers and Flesh is a lady, Sylvia Messi, mm -hmm. uh, who worked, you know, with System of a Down, Tool, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, to name a few. Why did you pick her? And do you think that the female taste, the female touch, and female sensibility is a bonus in the final result of this album, like an extra oomph? No, <laughs> I would not say that, no. Uh, it was more about her as a person, not as a lady, okay. so to say. But uh, mm, one But thing that made us interested in her was just that it felt so different. We had all we were we had to choose a producer. Mm. And we had all these blah, 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 American radio guy. I did these radio hits, whatever, you know. Yes, give me money. I don't really care. But if you pay me, I will put my name on it. Okay. You know, that kind of <laughs> that stuff. That kind of attitude, so okay. When the name Sylvia Massey first was brought up, that was something, in, because she was a female, that caught our attention in another way than we maybe would have treated somebody named... I don't know. Bob Massey. Bob, Bob <laughs> Massey, yeah. Yeah, so because, exactly, it becomes interesting because it's rare. Mm. But, the, uh, but the reason that she's there is because she, uh, and that we wanted to work with her is because she turned out to be a genius. She's brilliant at what she does uh, in every aspect of what a producer could and should do. Like, she, she was like three producers in one. Then, I don't know, like, the, the sense of the... Like the, the the female presence there, I don't know. Like I I would say that every good producer is a bit like a mother, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> nursing you in the studio. Anyways, I think also a good male producer should have a bit of of motherly instincts. I th I believe helps, okay. and to be able to be you know the, the right balance of being bossy and uh, and at the same time you know let you let your ideas grow and experiment with you and stuff okay. and be playful. So. I'm sure it's there, and but uh, again, male producers should the good ones are like that too. Okay, and the fans say that there's an extra melodic taste of madness and an extra, you know, um, lust for experimentation this time in this new record. Do you agree with that? And in which sense? Uh, yes, we agree. Yeah. Uh, Melody-wise, well, one big thing is uh, with, e with each album um, comes tours that trains my voice a lot. <laughs> so okay. for each album, I guess I have been, uh, like, in that sense of it, just been able to do more as a singer, which has opened more doors for us in the way we write. But also experimentation was that we don't have this very fixed rules about what type of metal we are or are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. like how much of it can sound like Florida death metal from October 1989 and yeah. how much can be, uh, I don't know, Italian symphonic power metal influence. Like, we don't have those rules. We play around with everything. And, like, we have a big reference point and source of inspiration for that was actually Queen and the Beatles mm -hmm. in the sense that two bands who could be so diverse on, on, on their albums and on the stuff they did, but they still always sounded like Queen and the Beatles. Yeah. And we believe that, you know, that our sound is not so much that we have to play the chord C and then a D minor, and that is our sound. Our sound is that John is the one behind the drum kit and I'm the one singing and, you know, and so on with all the guys. And then we just do what we want. So the fact that um, you, you're defined, labeled, in a sense, melodic death metal, since the be beginning is a bit, or, a bit borderline at the moment, it's a kind of limitation. Yeah, our roots are absolutely there somewhere because when we learned to play together, we played death metal songs and melodic death metal songs. We covered The Haunted and the Cannibal Corpse and uh, everything in between. And so our roots are there in a huge part. And, you know, I do growl a lot and we play heavy music and there are melodies. So. Sure, but I, I don't think it tells the full story. Okay. Because now melodic death metal, I think, is clearly defined as like, you know, the Gothenburg sound and yeah. around that maybe certain carcass albums and stuff that we like, and which is part of what we're doing, but not necessarily what the main definition of us today. But at the same time, we say 
heavy metal 2016 because that's the year now and uh, and the categorization is more for the listener than for the author i okay. feel um your latest press release states uh, with glorious nightmares we didn't dare to dream of avatar is once again taking us all on a journey they promise won't hurt for long so the key for avatar is actually to shock the people or to make them think uh, what you know where this journey is getting to well, i guess both shock and thoughtful stuff is very <laughs> both equally interesting to us Okay. Again, with the extreme music factor and the visual we are doing. Uh, but beyond that, I think our main interest is to p make people feel something. Mm. And I don't know, to put, to sound, I, I, I can't think of a non pretentious way of saying it, but <laughs> I, I don't know, put, uh, put a soundtrack to different emotions, you know, mm -hmm. and to express whatever we feel. And, uh, I don't know, I guess that is a very common thing for a band to want to achieve. So to make people think, uh, not in the sense of like, oh, you have to vote for the purple striped uh, dotted polka dot party and stuff. You know, it's not to make people think like that, at least. Okay. It's more the emotional ride and what that can mean to people individually, I guess. How would you sum up your story for those that maybe, you know, don't know the band yet and are actually maybe seeing this interview for the first time and, you know, knowing about Avatar for the first time? How would you say, you know, to present the band and to sum up your story? We are older than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I don't know. That's a, I don't know. Like, well, we... Well, if, if you like metal music you just check it out and judge yourself pretty much that's yeah that's the most sellish we can say i suppose yeah, i think like, we have become you know we are not good at sales pitches nowadays <laughs> you you uh, you kind of over the years lose interest for that it's kind of like like okay i can say i am very very confident in that we put on amazing shows and i am very proud of our music yeah and uh, but other than that like hey lou we are avatar here you know Okay. Here you are. Listen to it. You like it? Cool. Uh, you don't? Look at the fake. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> so you've done a lot of tours. You, you've done six records, but the perception is that your career is building in a slow and solid way, mm -hmm. which is very rare. You know, recently, uh, working hard, but step by step. Is mm -hmm. the perception correct? Very. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think it's been taking off a bit more in the last couple of years. But uh, yeah, we've been, again, because we grew up together and because we, our first album came out when we were so young, um, it's been a long story. But that is also, especially metal, that is the bands with the most longevity through the years. That is exactly what they have done. Yeah. Like, I don't know, other Swedish examples like. I'm on a Marth and Opeth, I guess, are two of the biggest metal bands in the world right now in yeah. like proper metal music. And it took forever. But it's also like it's been very non compromising. And we take example in that rather than, I don't know, some flavor of the week uh, <laughs> group who comes and like sings baby, 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 but still mush, please. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and then everybody forgets about it because it didn't really mean much. Yeah. And do you think that your impact is stronger as a live band or in the studio or both ways? And actually, how do you want to, you know, write rock history more as a live band or, you know, being considered like a band that put out, you know, solid records? As a band, I suppose. Yeah, that is how we want to write <laughs> rock history. And yeah. with that comes both live and studio and videos and everything else, art, like yeah. everything as a band. Exactly. And yeah, because there are those bands, again, we can say Queen, we can say Hammerstein, where you listen to the album and like, oh my God, they're geniuses. And then you see the show and it's like, holy crap, like, and they nail everything. And you see the music video, like, uh, like where everything just works. Yeah. Like everything is part of the art project avatar. Of e and it all has equal importance.
You have also a very strong image, which, uh, you know, is um, that you, you cure in a sense that it's detailed. Mm -hmm. It's never a case. Um, do you have different influences musically and visually and how they come together, you know, with Avatar? Well, yeah, uh, that they differ from each other, you mean? Mm, it, it, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, because, uh, again, on the visual side, it, all, it comes from a bunch of strange places that, you know, you can go beyond, you know, you can go beyond just, you know, music influences music naturally. And it's rare that a sculpture can inspire, uh, like, oh, yeah, I want, this sounds like this sculpture. That, that's mm -hmm. a bit trickier. But on the visual side, you can be inspired by other bands, which we are, plenty, but also movies, yeah. professional wrestling, uh, books. Like that can come, there's so many ways you can visualize things. But then again, the main influence on our visual, on the visual side of what we're doing is the music. So okay. again, the reason why this whole circus thing works out so well for us is because that turned out to be exactly how we felt our music should look like. Okay. We try to look like music, if that makes sense. A sort of see with your ears and hear with your eyes, yeah, something like yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, be yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. also that is how you know a riff is good when you're writing, is when you start imagining things. Okay. Like again, oh, okay, this song, oh wow, it sounds like you're in space. You know, and of course then that leads the vision of probably the lyrics will be in space as well and everything. And then, you know, you need to wear a space suit when you sing that song or, you know. This is of course simplified, but that principle, and so it's yeah. all again. You see what the music sounds like. It's true. And do you see that? Do you think that uh, your actually the concept, you know, music and image is still developing for Avatar, or you're actually uh, fulfilled with what you reached after 15 years? Oh, we're never fulfilled. Okay. We're never. We're never done. <laughs> There's always something to improve on and also change and. Like what, how we feel about it all, like it's still inspiring, exciting and interesting where we can take this. Mm. And as long as it feels like that, there can never be a full fulfillment. Yeah. You know, that goes hand in hand. Just the fact there's no perf real perfection in art. I'm, I'm sure even, you know, stuff now that a guy like Bach probably also sat there after writing this Voltempriert the Klavierbuch, blah, 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 you know, and like after, ah, I should have, I should change it. Next, next, next piano book will be, mm, I'll fix that, you know. Okay. I'll fix that, the cheesy part there in the middle. <laughs> so, Johannes, you're um, uh, actually painted as mm. a clown mixed to the crow, something like that. Is that, you know, what's the character? Do you give a name to that? And why no. you're the only one actually painted, full full painted? Well, because, again, uh, because for the, sim I guess the two answers there go hand in hand. I don't have a stage name. Like, for instance, with, when it comes to Alice Cooper, it's, that's obviously not his real name and it's a character like and how he always described he wants to be there you know rock and roll was so full of superheroes he wanted to be a villain so he created the character alice cooper yeah that he plays which is brilliant but for me and for the band it's more about self-realized realization i guess it's called yeah uh, and uh, and therefore it's you know johannes ekstra on stage also when i look like that i just get to express another side of me and that mm. is also like the reason why it only works for us that I do that is simply because that is who I am. Okay. And John, if you look at him on stage, he's also totally himself on stage, uh, but also very, very terrifying. But he's being it through being himself. Okay. So he can he he you know he he does his makeup <laughs> and brushes his hair in the way to express who he is. So still, you know, it's. It's about finding that thing inside of you to get out there to express. Somewhere it is the clown that is the storyteller of the mm. lyrics that okay. we're having. So as we just talked about, like, look how it sounds and b extend the music to another level. But then again, as you say, like, if we would have sit here with the makeup and stuff, it's, it's not a gimmick. Like, there are yeah, a lot exactly. of these American okay. gimmick bands that uh, we are not a big fan of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's important for us to differentiate. 
Okay, Grazie. now I give you a few names. Um, Kiss, White Zombie, Rob Zombie, Marilyn Manson, Slipknot, or Rammstein. Which band do you, do you feel closer to, you know, for the concept and the music? Um, Avatar, you know, what, you know, kind of band is compared to this, you know, legendary names? Oh, Ram. Stein, I <laughs> guess, okay, yeah, but it's, again, it's a huge okay. mix of a bunch of things still, yeah. like, I remember listening to Kiss as a kid, and again, the first time I wanted to paint my face was because of Gene Simmons, and I don't know, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, like, if, if any name, maybe Rammstein, but it's more like all of them, okay. yeah, I were a big fan of, and, but just as much as those makeup wearing bands you just mentioned, like, there's also bands like... Queen, okay. that is also a big influence, and and even though there is no makeup, they look exactly how they sound and everything yeah, they, they do had, is you like know, a, a strong image. Uh, yeah, uh, anyways, but, but also especially like, in the yeah. early days. Exactly, <laughs> but but it doesn't always have to be so elaborate, and still image can okay. be strong. I, uh, Foo Fighters is yeah. a band, as an example, we talk about a lot because that's jeans and t-shirts and a nice yeah. button-down shirt. Because that is also, again, exactly what it sounds like if you listen to them. It sounds like jeans and t-shirts yeah. and good times, you know, uh, so it makes total sense. And that is, to us, equally inspiring okay. as it is with, you know, the more extremely visualized, visual stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, did Avatar the movie, you know, epic science fiction, you know, by James yeah, Cameron yeah. that, you know, Everybody Epic, knows, which Epic, was a I'm not sure. <laughs> big, big phenomenon in 2009. Some way influenced you, paradoxically, I must no. say, since you came very first We came, first before, of we it, came before the movie, and yeah. it was more googling our name became trickier. <laughs> okay. um, I always hoped that we would get sued so we could change the name of the band into other James Cameron movies. So we are no longer Avatar, we are Terminator 2. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And uh, how do you work on your fantastic videos? Uh, they're sort of mini movies, in a sense, mm. and which is the process. I mean, d d do you pick the songs first uh, because you vision, you know, that they can be perfect in a, in a video? It's a and bit do, mixed. do you have a team? Do you work on yourselves? Which are your favorite directors? How do you choose the actors? We have you know? one director. John is uh, basically <laughs> producing. All of them, like we, and we, it, it, it's, it, 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 you know, so he does most of the cut casting and organizing where to record it and everything, and and I guess co-directs a lot with our guy Yuan Kalian is the guy who done all those with. We come up with the ideas yeah. uh, within the band ourselves, and you know, sometimes it's it's 50, 50, 70, 30, 30, 70, like a bit mixed how much ideas we who makes what, but it's always this self-made thing. And, you know, usually we, you know, a bunch of music videos you do because that is the single that needs a music video. And so we started that. But there are a couple that we made that we chose well, for because of the music, because of the idea. Yeah. Black Waltz was like that. Torn Apart as well, I guess. We're thinking, oh, this sounds like a fight song. Let's Vol make... Vulture's Fly. Too. Oh, Vulture's Fly as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. And... Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, so often it's the again the artistic vision that decides what we're gonna put out there. Okay. And then sometimes you know I don't know uh, smells like a freak show became a single. I guess it was like that. Now try to remember. Mm, I can't remember. No, <laughs> but it, it, it's a bit mixed. The re you know what where what it starts with. Is there any director that you like in particular that you can call an inspiration con concerning the videos? Many. Uh, Jonas Åkerlund is the only name I can think of now. Then is that French guy who did Björk and did uh, uh, lots in the 90s. Okay. Uh, I can't for my life remember him now. Name now. And yeah, yeah, no, but a whole a whole lot of things. And because and we also look a lot on actual movies when we. Uh, when when we do it, not just music videos like yeah. Hail the Apocalypse was, you know, of course, a bunch of old t tricks from, you know, the silent movie era that made it in there purposefully. What was that guy's name? Mm. 
alcohol. <laughs> it's all gone okay. now. Trip to the moon. Okay. Yeah, okay. exactly. The guy who did the the yeah the, okay. the, the, the moon the moon one. <laughs> yeah. As we just mentioned, um, Avatar come from Sweden, uh, from the same town as Hardcore Superstar, which is Göteborg, mm. Göteborg, as you mm, say yeah, that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, they are of course a very different band. But is Göteborg like the core, the heart and soul of Swedish rock? Can you, can we actually define, you know, that town like that? Is there a reason why the scene is happening there? Well, there's well, also a the, scene happening in Malmö and Stockholm, and, and the Hives is from Fagersta, and yeah. Meshuggah is from Umeå, uh, you know, so it's, uh, I think Sweden in general is a country, fortunately enough, it's, it's a good place to be born if you grow up being into wanting, you know, to play the guitar. Because, you know, the, the opportunities to find somewhere to rehearse, to find somewhere to play, to... Uh, find friends that yeah. are also playing yeah exactly and, and just you know and and to be able to afford to play like the support you get to take music lessons and stuff yeah. and also culturally it's not so much not that many fathers who yell stop that silly music nonsense and become a doctor or i disown you you know so it's it's i think it's all over sweden then uh, like and the gothenburg in particular i mean most of that Boom, Gothenburg happened anyway, like mid '90s until the late '90s. Yeah, you know, like uh, with heavy music at the gates and in flames and yeah. dark tranquility and all that. And also, hardcore superstar is slightly later, but also late '90s. And and I mean, it's not that hysterically much coming at the same time from Gothenburg now. No, there's always a new indie pop sensation in Sweden from there or something. But but I think it's more spread out. Okay. Do you have any uh, Spinal Tap moments yes. from the current tour or previous ones that you want to share with us? From the current tour? <laughs> oh, the, the venue was on fire in uh, Oxford, ah. right? Oh yeah. my god! Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a strong that one. A... Our merch guy David goes in like, and wants to open the dressing room door and poof, smoke all over him <laughs> oh and, and stuff. So we had to use a bar as dressing room, which was much nicer yeah. actually, so it was a win. But I, yeah, I can tell you, British dressing rooms are not so nice <laughs> okay. very often. <laughs> okay, that's clear. <laughs> All right, so you toured with a lot of bands mm. Slayer, Arch Enemy, Avenged Sevenfold, Dark Tranquility, Megadeth, just to name a few. Uh, which was the most fun to tour with and to share the stage with? And which one was the best school of rock for you guys? Oh, the best school of rock is the first tour <laughs> in, in Pain, Pain Lazarine yeah, from Finland. Because again, we were 18 and 19 years old. And oh, a tour bus. I guess we are Guns N' Roses now. <laughs> Let's drink all the booze and make, you know, make asses of ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, we learned how to load, unload, take care of the merchandise, not kill each other uh, or anyone else, and just handle being so many people, so many different countries, all that. Then I don't most fun. I just love the fact that we mostly headline nowadays, you know, because for the obvious reason that we get to, you know, do a full set and realize our vision. Uh, but then I had to, for me, especially mention when we toured with Halloween, because mm -hmm. that is what made me a metalhead for real was hearing them the first time. Okay. And uh, they were. Again, you, you know, you got to see them. I don't know how many shows we did with them, but let's say 18 shows in a row, and we watched every show, and it was always great, especially musically, how well they played and played together. And uh, nice enough people, like you could tell, like, tell me again about when you wrote Eagle Fly Free, please. <laughs> and they did, you know. Uh, so, and so you learned a lot through that, of okay. course, and always. Bands who have been around for a long time usually have that for a good reason. Mm. Mm. And they are able to be fun, have fun, and perform well consistently every show we saw them with. Mm. And why the viewers watching this interview right now should go immediately to pick a ticket, you know, to buy a ticket for uh, an Avatar show. Uh, give them a reason to come to the show and, you know, what they can expect. There's a lot of program thing. I mean, it's, yeah, I it's have a more show. costume changes than Lady Gaga. Oh. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> so that's a good reason. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, uh, okay. we are re very proud of our shows, and we don't discriminate depending on the size in a venue. You know, there are there are some places in the world where we get to play for thousands, and there are some places in the world where we get to play for hundreds. Okay. And we still fill that stage with whatever we can fit on it, and we still try to destroy ourselves and the people watching every show like we uh, we care a lot about this okay last question so your story is already very long and rich but what's next and what's your main goal at the moment vacation yeah <laughs> okay you dream of vacation <laughs> vacation All right. and uh, after that I don't, you know it's now we started a couple months ago it started to become harder and harder not to think about the next album at mm -hmm. least for me like like these little ideas and the challenge now when you've done a concept album, something so specific, is the next album would definitely not be another once upon a time there was a thing that happened, here's the song. Because now mm -hmm. we did that. Okay. So it's, it's not so interesting anymore. But still, when I feel like we learned a lot about seeing, thinking about the big picture and not just trying to do, ah, oh, here's a good song, here's another good song, here's another good song. So the challenge now is to keep thinking about the big picture okay. again without repeating yourself. Now we did a book, so I, I don't know. We're going to Hollywood, I guess. Oh, <laughs> or, wow. or set up a musical. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, guys, for your Thank time. You. And Thank you. Enjoy your stay in Italy. Bon ciao. 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 <laughs> Arrivederci. Grazie mille. Uh, Grazie a voi. Vuoi fare la pipì? <laughs> okay. My dog speaks Italian.